Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our newest webinar titled Why Advocacy Can't Wait. We are so excited to dive in and learn from our panelists and our moderator. My name is Dara Joyce. I'm on the marketing team here at Phone to Action and will be overseeing the operations for this webinar. Just want to run through some quick housekeeping items before I hand off to our moderator, Stephanie. Number one, audio. If you're running into any sort of audio issues, please let me know in the chat section. Um, I'll see if there's anything I can do to help and try and come to the rescue. Um, number two, we will be uploading a recording of this webinar to our website after this, so feel free to check back after to re-watch or share with anybody who might be interested. Uh, we'll be having a Q&A at the end, so feel free to submit any questions for our moderators and our panelists there, and they will address it at the end. And tech difficulties, having any tech issues, feel free to write in the chat section requesting support. And again, we'll come to the rescue and do the best we can. And finally, feel free to follow any live feeds around this webinar on social media with our hashtag advocacy can't wait. And with that, I would like to pass the reins over to our amazing moderator, Stephanie Stoffer. Thank you so much, Dara. I am so excited to uh, get started here this morning, or rather this afternoon. We've now hit the noon mark here on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Stephanie Stopper. I am the Director of Strategic Accounts at Phone to Action. Uh, I've been with the organization for a couple of years now, but I've been in this industry for um, close to a decade at this point. So I'm really excited to dive in. We've got a great panel here. And what we're going to be talking about really is how to um, take advantage of the, the next couple of months that we have here leading into some really big milestones that we're gonna hit this year. A lot of what we're hearing from folks right now is, you know, we're sort of in the doldrums of the summer, so how do we keep folks engaged? How do we take the opportunity to, you know, ramp up our advocacy efforts or at least start laying the groundwork for all of the great things that are coming next? So before we get into um, you know, the, the meat of the conversation, I certainly want to take a moment to introduce our panelists and have them um, kind of talk to you about themselves and the programs that they run. So we'll start with Paul Shanks from Dominion. Paul, if you want to give a quick intro and you know, give us the kind of 101 of uh, Dominion's advocacy program, that'd be great. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a great opportunity to to share some of what we've learned and, and, and hopefully to learn from some of y'all during the Q&A at the end if we have time. Um, I am privileged to get to work with a great company, Dominion Energy. Uh, we are about uh, six or seven years into our formal uh, advocacy program uh, evolution, uh, although we've certainly been doing advocacy uh, for, for longer than that and longer than I've been with the company. Uh, we are um, really excited uh, to continue to evolve the program forward uh, with what began, well, I'm sure you guys are, have all experienced a, a very humble place, uh, has now moved into uh, a, a more sophisticated uh, brand and, and public policy advocacy uh, operation. So um, excited, excited to, to talk with you all. Awesome. And up next, we've got Christine Telford from EEI. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's it's great to be here. Thanks to Phone to Action for pulling this together. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Christine Telford. I'm the Senior Director of Public Affairs at Edison Electric Institute, um, otherwise known at EE, as EEI. Um, for those that aren't familiar, EEI is the National Trade Association for all the investor-owned electric power companies. So we're proud to have Paul and Dominion is one of our members. I'm also a little biased. I'm a happy Dominion customer. Um, so excited to, to do this event today with Paul. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to talk about EEI's advocacy work and our We Stand for Energy community, um, which started about six years ago. Awesome. Yeah, we're we're definitely going to look forward to to hearing more of the details about both of y'all's programs. You know, before we get into it, I think I speak for everyone both on the panel and probably attending this that uh, it's incredible that we have made it already through halfway through July. Um, this year has been, you know, nothing short of um, unprecedented, I think, is one of the common terms, one of the buzzwords that everyone uses, unprecedented, uncertain, um, all of the, the crazy words that we've been throwing around. Um, and, and with that, I think we're starting to have a lot more conversations with folks, both on the, the corporate side and from, you know, trade associations and nonprofits, 
who, you know, as I mentioned, are looking at the calendar and thinking, wow, there really isn't a lot of time left in, in 2020. And on top of that, we've got some really huge milestones, you know, kind of coming our way. And, uh, you know, right now, we're sitting at the midway through July, we've got Congress in session, we've got an infrastructure bill that may or may not happen, we've got additional stimulus bills that may or may not happen. August is summer recess. Typically, we see candidates going out into, you know, districts and doing, you know, site visits and whatnot. That's going to look a lot different this year, certainly. In a lot of places, we're starting to see more kind of virtual site visits and uh, virtual town halls happen. September, we've got National Voter Registration Day and that kind of post-Labor Day push into election. You know, we're 111 days out from the general election, which is just incredible. I just, I can't believe that we're already 111 days out, and especially when we get inside that 100-day mark is when, you know, certainly things start to to really ramp up. And then amazingly, 60 days after that, we've got inauguration and, and of course, the start to you know, 2021 legislative sessions that are also kind of unknown at this point. There's a lot to be determined on which states are going to be in session on time, which are going to be doing, you know, kind of a virtual session again. I, I think there's only a handful of states right now that are really committed to to having legislative sessions in 2021 right now. So there's really still a lot to be determined. And so, um, you know, Christine and, and Paul, what I'm really curious to, to hear from y'all is, you know, when you're looking at this and, and the, the short amount of days, frankly, that we have left in the year, how are you starting to balance, you know, the priorities with your advocates and all of these different events coming up? So how are you and your organization kind of, um, you know, thinking through this? And Christine, we'll, we'll start with you. So how are, how are y'all communicating to your advocates right now? Sure. Um, well, that's a, that's a great question. I'm looking, I'm looking at your slide, Stephanie, because it's hard to believe that, you know, we have summer recess coming up. We've got the general election. Um, it, you know, we still have several states that are still in session. Hard to believe because so many states um, adjourned due to COVID, but many of them are coming back into session. Many of them have special sessions coming up. I believe Virginia might be one of them. Um, some have veto sessions coming up. So, you know, for us, a lot of this is very much day by day of seeing what is popping up um, in the state. And, you know, we, we balance that with a lot of um, more of our evergreen content. You know, we partner with our EEI communications team um, where we have an edit, they house our editorial calendar. Um, so obviously we can't forget some of the important milestones in our industry. Line Worker Appreciation Day was last week. You know, it's still hurricane season. So we're still um, touching base with our community and educating them with, with information about that. Um, National EV week is I think in September. Um, so, you know, we're, it's, it's an, an interesting balance of trying to deal with a lot of the policy issues that are still existing despite COVID, but also um, making sure that we talk about some of the important things that are happening in our industry day to day. And so what does that look like in, in practice right now? Is it kind of more, you know, more email communications? Are you having to be more specific about, you know, the priorities that you pick and choose? Or, you know, how do you kind of strike a balance without achieving that level of fatigue that we see a lot of times in, in times like this where there's a lot going on? Yep. So it is, it's, it's a lot of email, as you can imagine. We've had to get creative um, with the way we communicate with uh, with our advocates. So more regular emails about topics that are um, that are relevant. Uh, like many organizations, we started a podcast um, early into the COVID process talking about the industry, its response to COVID and, and kind of um, the different facets of, of what that looks like. Um, and, you know, I think we'll talk a little bit about this later on in the conversation, but it's also kind of looking at our audience and figuring out what they're interested in hearing about based on what they've taken action on in the past, right? So segmenting your audience and thinking about um, what information do they find valuable? That's that's really important during this this kind of strange time we're in. Yeah, trying to find those kind of overlaps in terms of what, you know, your advocates are interested in versus what, you know, your priorities are and what's going to be most effective. You know, Paul, what does that sound like on the on the corporate side, of course, you know, given that y'all are sort of a employee focused, you know, advocacy program, but also maybe doing some public facing issues. What's that balance look like for y'all? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of what I'll mention is follows along with some of the some of the work that Christine and team are doing. You know, much like my neighbors uh, across the street from me, um, who, who I get a view of their front yard uh, every day because I'm working from home, like many of y'all are. Um, uh, they are they've grown a garden in their front yard during COVID. Um, we we see uh, this time period as a time to focus on on tending our garden. Uh, we are focusing and doubling down on the basics for our core audiences. Uh, employees, retirees, shareholders, uh, those that have engaged on call to action campaigns in the past, um, you know, really trying to be focused on uh, some content principles of, you know, what can we give more than we take during this window in a way that keeps them engaged. And so a lot of times that lo is looking like email. Uh, a, a lot of times that's looking like providing content in the form uh, of engaging webinars or, or podcast content that uh, encourages our, our database to not only connect with us, but to engage at that educational and awareness level, uh, but hopefully uh, continuing to, to move them through through the through the advocacy funnel. What we don't want to do is, as I'm sure everyone is really aware, you know, with the wall of sound that is coming our way because of the election in November, we don't want um, uh, our advocates to feel like the first time we communicated with them or the first time they heard us was uh, on the day after the election. Uh, and so trying to find thoughtful ways to uh, inject um, meaningful content that provides value uh, in this space of time is, is a challenge, uh, but, it, but it's a good challenge too. We think that we're gonna come out of this period uh, with a really healthy, healthy list and healthy database of folks who are engaged with us uh, for the right reasons. That's awesome to hear, and that um, that garden analogy just had the rancher in me thinking of all of these ag analogies that we could apply here. <laughs> I think there's there's certainly a lot to be said for you know you're sort of you know planting the seeds and you know going to eventually kind of you know see the fruits of your labor so to speak in the in the future hopefully. I'm I'm curious from actually both of y'all's perspectives, um, you know, given that I know there's a lot of overlap in, in the issues that you're working on, but you know, even the feedback, what, what kind of feedback are you getting from lawmakers right now? Do you feel like they're receptive to, you know, an advocate's message or are they totally inundated? What's been sort of the, the sentiment from, from that side of things? Definitely. Uh, this is Christine. I guess, I guess I'll start. I mean, I'm thinking about a lot of the stuff we've been working on from a federal perspective in recent weeks. Um, and again, I think we'll talk about this a little later down the line, but um, we've been doing a ton of advocacy um, within the coronavirus package around LIHEAP, which is the Low Income Energy um, Home Assistance Program. It's a program that is hugely important um, to our customers and helping them afford their electric bills, especially during this time when so many people are out of work and, and struggling. And so, um, we, it's actually been one of the most successful campaigns we've ever run and we're still running it right now, but, um, you know, trying to break through everything that's going on, especially at the federal level is very difficult. Um, finding those issues that resonate, I think LIHEAP is one of them. Um, you know, I, I can't directly say that let lawmakers say, yes, you know, that we're this, you know, this is definitely, um, something that's resonating with us, but I mean, it's it's resonating with our community, which I think is very important, which at the end of the day, I think will resonate with elected officials. Um, but, you know, trying to figure out what, what are those issues that can break through everything that's going on, which as you mentioned, kind of with your timeline, there's a lot. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest challenge right now. Yeah, the, the opportunity right in this window for a public service corporation like Dominion Energy, you know, we serve uh, customers across 18 states uh, providing essential services, uh, you know, the reliable, the ability to flip a light switch and, and expect and see power or the ability to light a pilot and, and warm your house or cool your house. Um, that's essential services. And so a lot of the, the opportunity during this window is to make sure legislators are aware that first and foremost, uh, our our organization and our team members are out there every day providing frontline service, uh, essential work, uh, safely in a way that um, is essential to keep civilization moving, especially in a time when we are all responding differently uh, and when safety is top of mind. 
uh, as a result of the pandemic. And so there's been really great opportunity for Dominion Energy advocates uh, to remind elected officials that, you know, what we're doing is vital to the community. Uh, and this is an, a particular window of time in which we're seeing really good feedback from elected officials where uh, across our footprint, we've had really good policy success in making sure that they we are getting these correct designations in terms of uh, essential workers and we're seeing correct uh, designations in terms of phases of reopening as it relates to our operations and our employees uh, but uh, you know making sure that the narrative of of the linemen and the pipeliner and the gas worker uh, that um, keep civilization moving are a part of the conversation of, uh, that elected officials consider when they consider consider essential workers during this time frame. It's been a big focus for us and we've seen really good response from from elected officials in those in those efforts. Yeah, I think I think both of y'all touched on some points that that we try to iterate to um, you know to our customers a lot, which is you know connecting with the elected officials has to be it has to be human and it has to be personal and it has to get to you know the issues that that really matter. And so you know the more personalized that you can make that touch point, you know I think that the higher value impact you have. Um, you know I think what we've seen a lot of, and this is kind of the next section that we'll we'll move into is. You know, as we have, you know, more and more conversations with organizations who are looking to the EEIs and the dominions of the world saying, hey, I think we want to do some of that. We want to be, you know, sort of to their point, but we don't really know where to start. You know, I think that's the probably the most common challenge that that we hear from a lot of organizations who maybe haven't yet put into, you know, put the time and resources into you know, building a program just yet. So, you know, I want y'all both to kind of think back to when, um, at what point y'all hit that pivotal point of the impetus of, hey, we really need to level up our programs or we need to, you know, kind of accelerate from, you know, point A to point B and, and try to really, um, you know, advance what we're doing here. So, you know, Paul, we'll start with you. I'd, I'd love to kind of hear what was, what were those conversations like internally when, you know, the Dominion team came together and said, hey, I think we could really do a lot more with some of these stakeholder groups that we're working with and, um, and, and what did y'all kind of come up with there? Yeah, I think there, there's an old saying that if you're not reading the signs, you're likely not getting to your destination. Um, th there were a lot of signs early on uh, that we needed to uh, be better to level up, as you say, Stephanie, our advocacy efforts, and and uh, and I threw a couple of those signs here that I think are important. And these are by no means unique to being in energy or even to the utility sector, but um, they these were the pieces that we recognized as being drivers for kind of establishing advocacy as a best practice uh, across our organization. Um, the the first one was uh, the rise of NIMBY and NIMBYism, right? Uh, what was once benign now became controversial. Dominion Energy, like every other utility, uh, has a has a responsibility to provide reliable and safe service. A lot of our infrastructure uh, was built decades ago, and as that dec that infrastructure ages, it's required that that uh, that infrastructure get replaced. Uh, there used to be uh, that a uh, upgrading a um, electric line so that cleaner, more reliable service could be provided to a community was not controversial. Um, and what we found uh, over the last five years is that local organizing uh, and local rise of um, those that uh, would not want activity in their backyard uh, became more and more prevalent. Uh, and in fact, um, we found that individuals, customers that would be in big, in big fans of solar fields uh, were also not fans of solar fields in their neighborhood uh, or folks that would be in big support of uh, fossil fuel or natural gas uh, resources weren't weren't keen on having a natural gas uh, upgrade uh, in their their region that would bring economic development and so uh, the rise of nimbyism was a big driver and that really came at the right moment for online organizing social media uh, six or seven years ago provided a great free way uh, for local communities to organize um, and then the la the third one is that national organizations began to fundraise off of local projects so very simple low-key, uncontroversial projects uh, were being uh, uh, taken advantage of by national organizations uh, that would come in and attempt to raise money or to build build a program off of very local, uh, non-controversial fights. And what we saw in, in number four here is that the process began to break down. Uh, projects and programs that were necessary and essential uh, for providing good service to our customers 
uh, we're now being bogged down uh, in uh, because of these new tactics that uh, the various types of, of groups were, were bringing to bear. So the conversations with my leadership at the time were, um, uh, are pretty simple. Uh, those that oppose these projects for any number of reasons uh, are faster, uh, more nimble, uh, better organized than we are. Um, we can continue to let projects run over budget uh, uh, and not be delivered on time and our customers hang out to dry, uh, or we can uh, decide to get smarter. So uh, we came a long way. Uh, this is um, some examples from about six years ago, and um, uh, I'm not, not super proud of these, so please don't laugh. Um, this is kind of the state of affairs where we started, right? We, there was a advocacy bone uh, in, in our culture. We knew that there was an opportunity, uh, but no one really knew what to do. Uh, uh, at one point, for a very short amount of time, there were display ads that were bought uh, with a phone number embedded in the creative uh, that wasn't clickable and wasn't able to use. Uh, there were emails that our public affairs teams would send to employees with uh, links to just the general uh, state legislative uh, page. Um, you know, this was a this was a um, a pretty rudimentary attempt. Um, but we did not let these failures or, or lack of data or data informed decisions uh, stop us. We decided to continue to evolve forward uh, and really bring in on partners like Phone to Action and uh, and others to help us advance our game so that we could actually, in a data rich, responsible way, um, start to see results uh, in. Uh, in our advocacy efforts. So the Dominion Energy Advocacy Ecosystem, we try to take a holistic approach. Uh, we see uh, that there are a lot of different reasons why someone might become a brand advocate for Dominion Energy uh, or for a Dominion Energy project. They may be a big proponent of clean energy uh, and the, the offshore wind uh, that we're bringing on board. They may be a, bit a employee who's proud to work at a company that takes uh, uh, the cares for the community. They may be any number of stakeholders, a member of the PAC, uh, part of our social media community. Uh, they may be a third party validator like uh, Christine and EEI. Uh, we want to take kind of a holistic approach. And I'm showing a couple of examples here. This one being one of the actual creative that I use in a pitch deck uh, to invest in advocacy at Dominion a long time ago. Um, pretty simple, uh, but kind of pulling together and bringing all these into as an example of how do how do you make the case like well that what we do with our stakeholders is actually really connected uh, to what our thought leaders and our PAC members are hearing and the employees and the advocacy app the third party validators and the social media community they're they're all connected or at least they can be and should be uh, if you're fully optimized and you've got your little the, garden the analogy here with the leaves on the tree <laughs> that's right that's right we're super super ag today yeah. Uh, um, you know, and using simple creative like this to, to demonstrate, you know, how often are are the arrows uh, for our various uh, core audiences pointed into different directions? And then asking the simple question, what what could we accomplish if we were all aimed at the same target? Uh, how how uh, could you create a a wall of sound around a particular issue, a compelling 360 degree case? Uh, for why uh, a project uh, should be approved or why a um, a, a particular program uh, is, is good for our community, uh, that's when uh, the things things started to click uh, from my leadership. Awesome. That was, um, yeah, I mean, I think we, I just took away a lot of that. I was nodding my head the, the whole time you were talking, I think. And and I think the way that y'all broken down your different audiences, too, is a really smart way to, to think about it. And, you know, Christine, I'm sure this is something that y'all consider over at EEI as well, but you've got to kind of figure out what's the, what's the way of speaking to each of these individual groups and how do you you know, really encourage and invoke that sense of, um, you know, wanting to take action and, and wanting to, you know, support the effort. So, Christine, you know, again, kind of going back to my original question to Paul, which is, you know, what was sort of the, the turning point at EEI, too, where y'all decided to kind of reinvest and, and try to really, you know, push forward the, the advocacy program? And I know we stand as one of the better of the trade association groups that, um, that I've seen. So, would love to hear kind of what the thinking was. 
Thank you. And, and thanks for those kind words, Stephanie. Really appreciate that. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, during my introduction that you know, we stand for energy, which is a project of EEI, our online grassroots platform, was started about six years ago. Um, it actually predates me and my time at EEI. Um, and it was developed like many, many other grassroots communities um, in order to mobilize advocates to engage in federal policy issues. Um, what we found or what my colleagues at the time found um, there really wasn't a lot going on in the energy space um, on the Hill at that time. And so it, it was, uh, you know, other than LIHEAP, which, which we've always advocated for fully funded every year, um, it was going back to the garden analogy. It was kind of this um, community that we would go to when we needed something, right? And then as the years progressed, and I'm sure Paul would be familiar with this, you know, things really got more state focused, locally focused, and that's really where the, the forefront of the issues are for our member companies. Um, increasingly, uh, we began getting requests for engagement and education at the local level on a variety of issues, um, everything from, you know, electric vehicles, um, clean energy issues, uh, uh, distributed generation, et cetera. And so as the increase in state and local engagement um, grew, uh, we realized, you know, this can't just be a program that's reactive. You know, we, we can't just have a bunch of advocates that is kind of a cold community that we just go to when we need something. Um, and so, you know, to Paul's point earlier, we need to keep them engaged. And so that's, I think that was the leveling up was when we realized, okay, we've got a lot more uh, requests from, from member companies to be engaged in this stuff at the state level. We need advocates that are clearly um, easy to mobilize. And so that means engaging with them on a regular basis, especially with, you know, things that aren't outright asks to do something. So that could be evergreen content, that could be educational information, like I mentioned earlier about um, hurricanes, um, storm recovery, um, celebrating our line workers, things like that. And so I think that that was the pivot point really was kind of the shift towards the states and just the uptick in, in um, asks from our members to really be engaged in those state and local issues. I'm curious too, um, Christine, do y'all ever, you know, I know that you you do a lot of the kind of traditional, you know, grassroots approach where you've got kind of that pre-written letter, you know, available to folks. And at what point do you ask people or ask your advocates to, to customize those messages and start to, you know, send more of their, their personal stories? Do you leave that for specific issues or specific audiences? What's kind of the, the best practice there? Um, we always give them the opportunity uh, to customize. I think you can probably see that in the, in the little screenshot. Um, we also try to create a couple different versions, right, of that, that um, pre-written form letter, um, kind of from different arguments, different perspectives. Um, we find that it kind of depends on the issue. I think the issues where people get very passionate about, LIHEAP is one of them, um, which is why I have a couple of these examples on the screen here. Um, like I said earlier, this has been probably our most successful call to action campaign on this federal issue um, that we've done. And we're seeing a lot of personalization on these. A lot of folks saying, I'm a LIHEAP recipient. I need this to keep my lights on. Um, you know, I'm out of a job right now due to COVID. Please, I, I need this funding in order to pay my electric bill. Um, so when you have that emotional element in there, it drives people to, um, to really personalize their message to their, to their congressmen. Yeah, and I think that aligns really well with with what we see from you know from other groups across different industries as well, and and certainly speaks to some of the stats I'll share in a few minutes about you know the trend lines that um, we've seen in advocacy as a whole. You know, in these last couple of months, I think 2020 uh, not only has been unprecedented just holistically, but you know also even just you know more on a micro basis for advocacy, it's it's been a really interesting year so far. Um, Paul, when we were prepping for, you know, this conversation, I know we had talked about the, the elusive or the not so elusive uh, engagement funnel, right? So, you know, this is a model that I think the, the whole industry really is familiar with in some way, shape or form, and certainly something that I used to, you know, uh, apply with my clients when I was a consultant, and then something that we, you know, certainly work through um, here at Phone to Action as well. You know, I'm curious, kind of talk to me about how 
y'all's program is sort of centered around this this concept and and how you are you know applying it in the you know the the programmatic approach yes okay, thanks um the, the you know the advocacy funnel is not new it's not rocket science uh, but it is a, a, a guiding principle that really does um speak to both the the tending the garden piece but also um the the idea that you know as uh, as christine mentioned what does it mean to have a living breathing organization uh fluid amongst different databases and, and names but what what does it mean to have people uh names and faces behind a database that actually are willing to take action um, and, and we have found at dominion energy that a holistic approach uh, of providing uh, folks at every step along the funnel from awareness engagement to action uh, is going to be not only the uh, the way to see the most success in terms of you know direct actions taken when needed uh, but also uh, the, the most cost effective way uh, there are so many uh, low uh, low barrier low fidelity cheap or free ways to keep uh, your audience engaged um, and uh, those pieces and those parts of, of our program have really proven to be uh, some of the richest uh, and and we, what we've finally seen is we actually see now uh, content flowing both ways uh, where ideas are coming from the co from the various or databases and coalitions uh, of stakeholders uh, coming back to us uh, we're seeing real in-person engagement um, and you know there there's certainly you could try to put an ROI model uh, together to attract a, a dollar figure to a, a form letter that goes to, to a legislator. Um, and that, that may be helpful in building the case. Um, what we found is that there is real um, value in demonstrating uh, the living, breathing, kind of organic nature of a healthy uh, operation. And so um, we use this model, uh, and although people may be tired of seeing that, we constantly call back to it because it is, it is so important that we don't forget uh, uh, when in the heat of the moment uh, when we need actions immediately uh, that the program is only as successful as, as we are at kind of operating at all three stages of the funnel. Yeah, it is funny. I feel like I've been referring back to the same funnel for the last probably five or six years at least, and yet I think it's still extremely relevant and uh, and still very timely. And Christine, I imagine y'all are sort of applying a similar logic to the way that you think about the the advocate journey with the with the We Stand for Energy advocates. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's you know, it's a, I always you know the funnel is. I see it a lot and then I kind of I'm like, oh, yeah, we do all that, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But, you know, we love petitions. I see that, you know, in the middle there. Um, it's like Paul said, a lot of these things are really cheap, easy, quick ways um, to, to make sure your advocates are kind of moving down that funnel. Um, petitions are really easy to set up, um, inexpensive. Uh, you know, in the past, a uh, long time ago, we've done town halls. Um, which is another great way, you know, to engage an audience. Um, and like I said, with with COVID, we've ramped up really on on email contacts, um, the podcast cr we created, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we we definitely go through this similar path. And a lot of these things, you know, are, are fairly uh, time, you know, inexpensive and and not don't take a ton of time. Yeah, it's amazing. It can take three minutes to throw a petition together, and yet the data that you get from it can be, you know, super valuable and, and really dictate, you know, a lot of the next steps that you take. So it really is one of those, I think, undervalued um, and, and sometimes often overlooked tactics. So I want to pivot a little bit. I mentioned at the at the beginning of this call, it's amazing that we only have 111 days left until election day. And, you know, as you can imagine, over the last couple of months, phone to action, and, and some of y'all may have seen this, actually, we've been releasing a, a digest on a weekly basis that I think just ran down about last week or two weeks ago, um, looking at, you know, data analysis across the platform to understand, you know, what new trends that we've seen in 2020 that we maybe haven't seen in, in previous years. And one of the things that has, that has struck us and is, is very, I think, indicative of where the population sits in terms of their propensity to take action is this red trend line for 2020 on just election year advocacy and an election year civic engagement. So this is, you know, voter registrations and polling place lookups and, 
you know, a lot of these activities that I think we obviously see some in, in midterm years, but it's no secret there's a lot lower turnout during midterm years. But even if you look at 2020 as compared to 2016, it's, it's really interesting to see this trend line, you know, so high as it is, especially with an incumbent president, because that also historically uh, has affected turnout. And we have now seen that uh, hopefully, I think we're going to see a lot higher turnout this year, or at least, you know, based on our data, we're seeing a lot higher, you know, engagement when it comes to the election. So I'm curious at what role, if any, is, is GOTV going to play in your advocacy programs this year? And, you know, how do you sort of decide how to message around it and, you know, how to be also sensitive to, to, to all of the other issues going on? And um, Christine, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, you know, for us, um, a lot of the election is is going to determine what um, what our members focus on in 2021. So we're keeping um, very close attention, especially at the state level to gubernatorial races, um, state legislatures and what that looks like. Um, from a GOTV perspective, uh, you know, EEI, we have a website called EEI Votes that uh, is managed by my colleague, um, Caitlin, who's our, who does all of our PAC and kind of political work. Um, and it's really a tool for our member companies. We share it with our member company CEOs, um, who then I think, you know, most of them share it with their employees. And it's, it's a really nice, just kind of one-stop shop for them to look up voting information online, their polling place, who's on their ballot, et cetera. Um, and so that's that's kind of our primary uh, GOTV tool. Um, I know that we're ramping stuff up this year in terms of you know getting folks engaged leading up to the election. So just adding extra information, you know, again with the weird times that we're in, um, information on how to request a mail-in and absentee ballot, which is so important right now. Um, we're seeing so many uh, uh, jurisdictions, you know, do mail-in only. Uh, type of uh, either ballot initiatives, local elections, et cetera. Um, and we're also adding something to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which is this year, if folks, uh, if folks don't know, uh, which is the women's right to vote. So uh, those are just a couple things that we're doing leading up to the election. But again, you know, a lot of it is uh, a wait and see to see what, um, what this means for us in the industry in 2021. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the um, the utility and energy industry is certainly not alone in, in that, in trying to look into everybody's crystal balls and try to figure out what the world is, is going to take place and uh, how things are going to shake out. You know, Paul, from the corporate side, how does GOTV play into to y'all's program, if at all? And, and what are some of the things that you're thinking about leading into the next, you know, 111 days that we've got left? Yeah, I think that um, GOTV is interesting on the corporate side, right? We are... Um, we want to make sure, especially from the political action committee side, uh, that the members are, are, are aware and educated. And Carolyn Morrison on our team, who runs our PAC, does a great job of making sure that uh, PAC members specifically, but also uh, some other audience as well, are aware of what the conversations are around energy policy headed into an election. Um, so that, uh, as Christine mentioned, regardless of the outcome and how we pivot from a policy uh, advocacy perspective, um, you know, our members are primed with understanding the issues. Um, and then in addition to that, we also um, leverage Front Action Civil um, uh, uh, engagement sites uh, and information to make sure that we're providing value to our audiences so that, you know, there's an easy place for them to find their polling location and to, to look into the issues. Those civic action centers are, are, are essential uh, as, as a part of our strategy to make sure that we are giving more than we take from our advocates. Um, if we're ever in a position in which we are asking more than we can provide value for, then we've gone upside down. Uh, and so as we get ready for um, uh, GOTV, we certainly aren't asking people to go out and vote for Canada X or B or, or Z, but we are looking to make sure that um, our core audiences uh, have an understanding of the issues so that, that when uh, we do get into an environment, maybe during the next legislative cycle or in the state legislators in, in 2021, um, those audiences are aware of the issues and, and they're also able to kind of self-serve some resources to learn more. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, I think we're, as we get closer, it's becoming clearer that this might actually be a tough of election and that might 
mean that there are going to be a lot of changes, especially for, you know, the energy industry and, and utilities in terms of how um, potentially a new administration looks at things and potentially a new Congress, you know, looks at different issues. And, you know, there's certainly a lot, a lot riding on this, you know, on top of being one of the biggest election years, this is also what we've seen in, in our data is so far the biggest year for advocacy. So um, when I say we've seen record breaking activity, I, I, you know, I don't say that lightly. We've seen so far this year, 6.8 million page views on civic action centers. But what that has also led to is a 93% year over year increase on, on phone to action as a whole. So we're not only seeing record breaking, you know, levels of engagement for the election, but it is also record breaking levels of engagement on advocacy issues. And this is across the board too. I think we have a lot of folks follow up with questions about, well, that's just because of COVID-19 or, you know, that's just the, the big push that we had kind of at the beginning of the year when the first, you know, stimulus packages were happening. Um, but truthfully, this is, you know, really across all different issues. And what this has really indicated to us is that I think, with the issues and there certainly is the COVID effect of I think a lot of folks are starting to their heartstrings are getting pulled a little bit right and they're also being given more opportunities to take action to make their voice heard there's also been a higher focus I think on the work that Congress does and state legislatures do for their constituents and so it's opened this gateway for organizations to take more advantage of that so I'm curious to hear from both of y'all as, as you look ahead and maybe this is ahead to, you know, the next part of 2020, or maybe it's ahead to um, 2021. What, what, what's next for y'all? What's, what's next for, you know, the advocacy programs? And how do you plan to, to kind of grasp some of this momentum and take advantage of it? And, um, you know, Paul, we just left off with you, so let's start with you. Sure thing, yeah. You know, we're at the stage now where we are not so much looking at state legislative sessions or federal sessions uh, or particular pieces of legislation, although those will play in. Um, we're looking at advocacy from a cultural perspective. You know, we now have a record of folks who will take action on behalf of the brand, uh, and they're doing so in really hard ways. Um, you know, what what can we do culturally to make advocacy brand advocacy, thought leadership amongst the rank and file, as well as executive leaders of the company, um, uh, a part of the way that we, we um, live and breathe. Um, and so we are uh, expanding and growing uh, our brand advocacy program uh, and our employee advocacy program. There will certainly be um, a lot of opportunity for call to actions uh, in that, but there's also a, um, a, a softer, more nuanced thing around um, cultivating a environment in which uh, stakeholders feel comfortable raising their hand uh, or lifting their voice um, in a way in which uh, is um, uh, not overly uh, managed uh, out of corporate, but rather encouraged from the grassroots. And so we're doing a lot of modeling uh, for uh, our employee base and what it looks like to, um, uh, to uh, be an advocate uh, online or in person, although I'll be honest, there's not a lot of in-person going on right now uh, for good reason. Uh, and so that's where we are. Uh, we think that this is a, a moment where we've proven proven the value of the idea, and it's now time to add kind of that, that cultural rich layer uh, on top of what is a really healthy, you know, action framework. Awesome. Awesome. And Christine, what's that look like for EEI? What's, what's coming up next for y'all? Um, I, I put in my notes, uh, <laughs> yes, exclamation point, because really it's it's all of the above, right? Like we're still very much in the thick of the COVID um, recovery um, and all the legis you know, all the legislative initiatives going through um, Congress right now. So obviously still very engaged in that. Like I said, state legislatures are, re some of them are reconvening, some are going into special sessions. Um, and I don't wanna say for the most part, but a lot of them are getting back to what I would call normal business, right? So um, while they're still focused on COVID, they're starting to pick up energy related issues again, which is great. Um, so that is still very much at the forefront for us. And I, I love this slide, Stephanie, about how this is the biggest year for advocacy because it reminded me, um, I was advising a member company on a ballot initiative campaign um, that ran back in May. And uh, you know we'd have our weekly campaign calls and they would just talk about the amount of engagement. And I mean, obviously it's due to COVID, people are stuck at home. Um, 
and they're just they're just devouring information. And it was, you know, the turnout. I mean, it was all mail-in only, but the turnout for this ballot initiative was unlike was unreal, you know, unreal. No one had ever seen this type of this type of participation before. And so thinking about that, and you know, it was simple things during that, like obviously they're not doing yard signs. Everything's online, everything's very much targeted advertising. So if that's kind of the environment we're looking at through November and maybe beyond that, you know, until there's a vaccine potentially, um, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned about how to get creative with our online advocacy. Um, last week uh, or two weeks ago, you know, EEI and its member companies participated in its first virtual fly-in around LIHEAP. Um, we had never, at least I'd never done a virtual fly-in before. So we stand for energy, did some targeted ads around that. Um, and so I think it's going to be a lot of, you know, again, getting creative, finding new, innovative ways to reach our advocates and our, our, our stakeholders and audiences um, in kind of this new and weird environment, which is fun, obviously, but also challenging. Yeah, and, and as you're, or I guess, you know, a lot of, I think, the folks on the call are probably looking to y'all for, um, you know, some guidance here. So if you were to give advice to an organization who is maybe considering, you know, reinvesting or amplifying their advocacy program, you know, what are some of the, the things that you would advise that they, you know, do first? And Christine, we'll start with you. Um, one of the biggest hesitancies I see among whether it's member companies or in my past life as a consultant among clients is there's always this hesitancy to engage like, oh, well, if we engage, um, will it reflect poorly upon us? And my thought process has always been policy is happening, right? Like people are making policy. It's just a matter, matter of whether or not you want to engage in that process and make your opinion known because constituents, voters, customers are making opinions based on what they see out there. So whenever there's a hesitancy of whether or not to engage in advocacy, I always rely on kind of that, that mode of thought that like, hey, you can either engage and participate in this process so that people are educated on your opinion or you can kind of stay on the sidelines. Um, so that's kind of my initial advice for folk, for anyone that's hesitant uh, to, to move forward with advocacy. My second would be, there's never really a good starting point, right? Um, you know, it, the title of this webinar is Advocacy Can't Wait. And, you know, we can say, oh, well, let's wait until the next quarter or let's wait until we have XYZ, but there's really no good time. Um, you know, start start as soon as, as you can or whenever, it, you know, whenever it makes sense for you. Um, because once you can start building that list of advocates, once you can start gathering data, it's kind of a ball that just keeps rolling, right? And then the more information you have that really guides um, where your campaigns will go, how you're able to look at your audiences and the more information you get and really um, looking at what your community will do, how they'll mobilize and what they're interested in. Yeah, you make a great point on, you know, just, it, I, I think I hear a lot of people kind of kicking the can down the road a lot of times thinking, you know, oh, well, you know, we'll wait till after this milestone or we'll wait till after the election and, you know, then we'll wait. And it's just like, <laughs> Excuse me, going back to our calendar, we've got too much stuff going on. You know, if you if you wait until you're not busy, you're going to be waiting for, you know, for forever at that point. So, um, you know, Paul, I know when we were talking through this ahead of time, you had some good advice on, you know, getting buy-in from leadership. And I think this is, you know, certainly an issue that, or, you know, any organization faces, but especially at the corporate level. So talk to us about, you know, kind of the process that you took here and, and, and what really kind of got your, your folks on board. Yeah, you know, none of this is rocket science, but this is a process that took a long time for us. Um, like I'm sure some of the folks on this call, Dominion Energy is a, a very large um, ship. It's more aircraft carrier. It does not turn on a dime. And so adding in uh, the advocacy program is a piece of what we did day in and day out. Um, what was not, didn't happen overnight, but it, but it did, it did happen and, and we're really glad it did. And this is kind of the process we followed. Now, first, we, we focused on understanding what leadership wanted to accomplish. Uh, and this was not about, um, you know, what, how do we want someone to vote on a particular bill? That's easy to get, uh, a yes or no vote on a bill with scorecard. But we wanted to know from leadership and really begin to understand and do our homework 
was, you know, what does success look like uh, beyond the, the immediate firefight that they're in? Um, and, and then how do you get a seat at the table, right? Really pushing to make sure that those in your organization who are responsible for advocacy or at, have a seat at the table. Now, too often, and I've seen it all the time and I hear it from peers in other companies, uh, that, you know, it, the advocacy becomes the, the last piece of the puzzle after the comm strategy and the public policy strategy and the um, regulatory strategy is agreed upon. Uh, then uh, advocacy gets a, um, you know, gets asked, all right, can you guys make this happen? Uh, and really, ideally, um, advocacy needs a seat at the table from the beginning, and, and it's hard to earn that seat. Uh, and it's important that you fight your way into the into the room. Uh, you get a seat at the table, and you come with ideas. You come with ways to um, to make uh, to pr provide solutions um, uh, to the to the issues that leadership and those in the policy world and other places are facing, uh, and may not have an idea of, of how to address it. Um, the next one I'll mention, and this is just so key, um, report, report, report. What we found is that, um, you know, no advocacy program is free. Uh, and so making sure that folks really understand uh, the data-rich capacity uh, to prove ROI on, uh, on, on these kind of efforts is doable. Um, but make sure that you're also providing a lot of really good anecdotal data. Um, a lot of what we do um, is, uh, in, in the, especially the digital space, may not in, be immediately translatable uh, to folks who don't live in that digital native environment all the time. Uh, and so making sure that you've got really good anecdotes that stick, uh, that uh, help uh, provide value in the way that uh, leadership can describe and pitch the program up the food chain is so important. Um, and this has to be done constantly, uh, big and small, Miles, don't wait for that monthly recap. Uh, really provide lots and lots of actionable data um, and anecdotes that, that are memorable. Uh, the, the next one I'll mention is, you know, really resist the secret sauce mentality, right? Um, what, what we are asking our advocates to do uh, and the way that we communicate with them is not special. Uh, it is uh, indeed intentional and strategic and um, extremely nuanced. Uh, but the, the more uh, your leadership understands what you're trying to accomplish uh, and understands how you're going to get it about, even if it means slowly bringing them along with some of the tactics, um, that mentality and bringing them on board really can create a, a deep sense of buy-in. Uh, and then, you know, what we found is that over time, you build that trust by further educating those leaders and the capabilities of a strong platform and how they support company goals, uh, helping them become more fluent in the capabilities of the program, you start to tr see trust established. Uh, but my encouragement to anyone who's in the middle of this and through the weeds is, is once you get to that trust level, that uh, to, to not slow down, but to continue that cycle all over again. Uh, because this is a, a piece of, of any corporate program or any uh, association program that may or may not be essential uh, to or, or feel essential to the business at any particular time. And so it's important that you continue to prove your value and to prove the value of the program and the advocates uh, over and over again. So there is light at the end of the tunnel is what I'm hearing from, from both of you. <laughs> um, I, think, I think both of y'all have, have done a great job kind of walking us through, um, you know, how you've gotten to where you are. Like I said, I think both of you are ex exemplary um, you know, programs and examples of, you know, how we can really be successful in this. Um, you know, we are almost at time. I did have a couple of questions come through, but I know, uh, you know, some folks are going to have to, you know, jump off. I appreciate, you know, everybody attending today. If you do want to get in touch with me, um, by all means, shoot me a note, shoot me a text message, whatever you need to. I'm, uh, I am at home and available. So <laughs> by all means, get in touch if you need to. A couple of questions did come through though. So I, I want to, um, Pose the first one to Christine, which was, you know, given the the breadth of issues, local, state, and federal, it was, you know, a kind of about how you balance that with your advocates, and are you doing kind of more broader based blasts and then more local based, you know, calls to action, or, you know, again, kind of reiterating that uh, that idea of, of avoiding that fatigue. How do you balance some of those issues? So right now, I would say uh, just in the time of COVID, a lot of stuff is, is pretty broad and national. Um, and again, you know, we're with the ramp up in our email newsletters and, and sharing of COVID-focused information, 
a lot of it's pretty broad. Um, as far as the local stuff, you know, a lot our work at the local level, we're a trade association, right? So we're member driven. A lot of that is driven by our work with our member companies and what they highlight to us is their priorities for engagement. So with legislatures kind of being a little bit quiet um, in the last several months, um, we've been able to kind of balance it and that shifting it more to those the broad evergreen messaging. Um, with stuff picking up in the next couple weeks, I would say that balance is going to uh, change a little bit as legislatures um, and, and localities start to pick up again. So we'll have to, I think, rethink that balance. But, you know, with our community, it's so diverse. Um, we have folks that are interested in so many different issues, which is why I think I mentioned it earlier, looking at our data and segmenting our our list and audience is so important, right? Like we have folks that are very passionate about electric vehicles that are very passionate about the low income, um, the LIHEAP piece, others that are passionate about grid security and storm recovery. And so with that balance, it's always taking a look at our list and understanding what folks are interested in and what they would be receptive to in terms of calls to action and education. Awesome. And we did have one more for Paul and then we'll be, um, you know, ready to wrap things up. Paul, the question was about what results you ended up seeing when y'all transitioned the program kind of to be more modern and onto, you know, the, um, you know, phone to action technology. Did you see an increase in engagement or, you know, what changes did, uh, did you notice? Yeah, I, it would be hard not to, um, uh, to describe it as a night and day switch, right? You know, there's, um, in, in addition to kind of increasing our strategic capabilities and staffing up and making sure that we have people that have the brain power to focus on advocacy, um, adding the right tools uh, to make it easy to uh, participate uh, in the process uh, was like adding fuel to a fire. Um, and so, you know, what we saw was a, a, a lowering of costs and increase in actions and then of course, uh, we also saw some tangible, really good wins right off the bat. And one of the things that is so essential if you're evaluating phone to action or any of your other pieces of technology in your advocacy stack is making sure that you've got uh, a platform and partners that will help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And so what we saw, and luckily we had the right partners when we made that pivot, um, and phone to action being a piece of that, uh, was a huge bounce uh, in conversion rates in our cost per um, action uh, we saw or decrease in our cost per action and success uh, that really made it easy to con continue the buy-in uh, from leadership and, and to grow the program excellent well with that we will wrap things up and again thank you to everybody who joined today i hope you enjoy the rest of your week if you're in dc please stay cool um, it is it is not cool out there, so hopefully you can find a pool to go to. Um, with that, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, again, these slides and uh, this recording will be available online as well.